The first one, Tetralogy of Fallot. What is that? It's a very simple concept. It's a hole between the lower chambers of the heart, and it's a blockage of blood as it leaves uh, to go into the lungs. And these babies, often at birth, are not symptomatic. They look fine. Ultimately, most of them will have what's called cyanosis or blueness and require open heart surgery. It really is the most common, what we call, cyanotic defect of the heart uh, that uh, we see in children. What's the usual age of diagnosis if you didn't want prepared for it? Well, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, we are now diagnosing very many tetralogy of Fallot patients in, in utero. It's an easy diagnosis to make. Usually the baby will be born with a murmur, so even though we may not suspect tetralogy, we do a sonogram and we find tetralogy. Certainly there are babies that could go two, three months and it would be undiscovered. But in general, with today's technology, we're picking this up quite early in life. Because these sonograms in utero and babies are born. Exactly. But, if you were to say, some, what is your child, what are the th hallmarks of it? The hallmarks are basically a heart murmur, which is going to be picked up by the pediatrician, and a baby who will turn blue or cyanotic, for example, with crying or feeding. That really is the way most of these babies behave, and they do have what's called spells. They can have what's called cyanotic spells, where they breathe very fast, they get very irritable and blue. We usually try to operate on these babies and take care of the problem prior to those spells occurring. Anatomically, what do you usually find in these kids? Usually what we find is a very specific uh, hole. Um, it's called a malalignment VSD, or a certain type of hole between the lower chambers of the a heart. VSD, you need a, a big hole between the two big chambers? Exactly. And the amount of obstruction or blockage to blood into the lung is variable. It can be at the valve, it can be below the valve, it can be above the valve, it can be all three. Many of these babies will have small arteries that go to the lung. So there's an entire constellation of, of types of abnormalities you see in tetralogy related to the blockage of blood as it goes into the lungs. About the aortic arch, is there anything wrong with that? Well, there's, there's a, a, a something called an overriding aorta, which is basically just a consequence of the position of the hole and the blockage of the pulmonary artery. And it's just one of the things that we see. It really doesn't have any great uh, clinical um, or symptomatic significance. How often do you see tetralogy of the well, since it's the most common congenital heart defect that presents with blueness, the overall incidence of congenital heart disease is about three in five per thousand live births. Probably a few percent of those will have specifically tetralogy or tetralogy-like diseases. So for a pediatric cardiologist, it's, it's quite, uh, quite common, and in specific syndromes, it may even be a lot more common than that. As we mentioned, in the DeGeorge syndrome, about 20% will have tetralogy of Fallot. And the surgery, what kind of surgery do they do for it? Well, the surgery has been done now for probably uh, at least 45 to 50 years. The operation consists of closing the hole with a patch and then relieving the obstruction of flow to the pulmonary artery, um, usually opening the valve, putting in a large patch. Sometimes you need to enlarge the pulmonary arteries. Uh, but it's an operation that is now done pretty much within the first three to four months of life, even if the patient is doing well, sometimes earlier if we need to. But with the current technology, tetralogy of fellow patients don't usually go beyond the first six months of life without having open heart surgery. And, and does that affect the child's life expectancy to some degree? The feeling now is that with a, a well-repaired tetralogy of fellow, there's no reason to expect that they wouldn't lead a completely normal life. Clearly, if it's part of another constellation, a syndrome, obviously the other factors, example, in the George syndrome, these children are often subject to having in infections because they don't have a thymus gland. Those babies may have trouble with infection, and that may be the primary problem even after the heart disease, like tetralogy, is cured. What other cardiac abnormalities do you would see with the joints? Well, we see uh, what's called conotruncal abnormalities. It's just a broad spectrum of defects. We see what's called an interrupted aortic arch, which also has the same type of hole as in tetralogy within the heart, but the aorta um, basically is blocked, completely blocked or interrupted as the aorta turns around to supply blood to the lower half of the body. There's also a lesion called truncus arteriosus, which again has a large hole between the lower chambers of the heart, exactly the same hole as we see in the tetralogy and interrupted arch. But in this defect, there's a single large valve coming out of the heart,
and the pulmonary arteries, which normally have their own origin out of the heart, are actually emanating from the aorta. So all of these lesions are very, very similar embryologically, which makes sense if you think that it's the chromosomal abnormality that is responsible for the George syndrome. There's no reason to think that the cardiac abnormalities would not be related to each other. Is there ever a situation where you can't repair the heart? Well, I, I would honestly say at this point in the development of cardiac surgery, there really is no lesion that does not at least have the ability to be physiologically palliated. When you say cure, children who are born, for example, with one chamber of the heart, like a hypoplastic left heart, we never give, give them back the chamber they're missing. But the operations that are done basically allows the blood, the blue blood to go to the lungs, the red blood to go to the body. It's basically a what we call a physiologic repair. And that's available to all forms of congenital heart disease. So if a kid is blue when the kid's born, that doesn't always even mean cardiac disease, does it? No, it, it clearly doesn't. Babies can be born blue because of abnormalities of the lungs. Sometimes babies are born blue that have neurologic problems. Uh, there are certain hematologic problems. Um, uh, metabolic problems. Babies who have low glucose can be blue at birth. But as a pediatric cardiologist, our job is to basically define those babies that have a primary cardiac problem, which is fairly common if you look at all babies who are blue, particularly babies that are full-term babies, not premature babies, and full-term babies who don't require ventilation, mechanical ventilation, are not in respiratory distress, but look well other than they're blue, those babies are more likely going to have a heart problem than not. But if you were going to look at a baby, and it was a full-term baby, and the kid was going to have a cardiac abnormality, what would be the hallmark of that blueness over some kid that had we call very benign blueness? Say, the the hallmark percentage. is that the baby is blue all the time, the hallmark is that the baby is not in respiratory distress, and the baby, in essence, looks well, except the baby has cyanosis all the time. There are babies, for example, who with feeding will turn dusky because there's an opening called the foramenal valley which stays open after birth, and some babies that blood will be pushed across and the babies will get blue just with feeding or crying. But that's very temporary and that goes away. The babies with heart disease really are blue and remain blue, regardless of whether you put the baby in oxygen or feed the baby or whatever. And sometimes the babies get very tired doing a little effort even eating when they have severe heart disease. Is that true? That's right. That's usually not the babies who have what we call cyanotic heart disease. Those are usually babies that have isolated holes in the heart where there's too much blood, not too little blood, too much blood going to the lungs, and that burdens the heart, burdens the infant, and they have trouble basically breathing. And whatever food you put in is burnt up, so to speak, because the heart is working so hard to maintain itself. So these babies not only don't do well in terms of their breathing, they don't gain weight, they don't thrive. But these are not babies necessarily who have what we call the blue babies. These are babies that have isolated holes in the heart. So we could say that there's a great potential of getting good results for kids with cyanotic heart disease. And if a kid has the George syndrome has a cyanotic problem, like the child tooth flow, we can fix a lot of it and make the life of this child barring the other syndrome much better. Is that true? That is very true. The DeGeorge syndrome, and I mentioned before, there's three major problems. Um, the thymus gland um, issue is one where the baby does not have what we call T-cells. That leads to various difficult to control infections. People are now doing thymic transplants for that. Then we have the absence of um, uh, the parathormone, which is basically the parathyroid gland, which produces a hormone, which is responsible for calcium metabolism. That problem can be solved by supplemental calcium. And clearly a very important part of this is the cardiac abnormality, which clearly today the types of abnormalities these children have can be fixed surgically. So in other words, having that diagnosis, we can do a lot of good things now. Absolutely. It is variable. I think what people have to realize, not every DeGeorge patient looks exactly the same. There are other issues in addition to the three I mentioned. Some have them, some don't. 
it's really not one particular, as we say, syndrome where every baby with the George looks alike. But the three major features are certainly three features that we can take care of, and hopefully the other things fall in place.